Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all here for this special event to celebrate the life of Di Morgan Evans. And I would particularly like to welcome the members of Di's family who are with us today, Sheena and, Di, Sheena and Di's three daughters, Alex, Kathy, and Sarah, and Alex's husband, Richard. And I know they'd be delighted for, uh, to speak to you later. Um, Di was General Secretary of the Society for 12 years, from 1992 to 2004, during which time, as I'm sure you're all aware, he made a tremendous contribution to the life of the Society, and we're going to hear more about this later. And he was immensely popular with staff and fellows alike, and the Society is therefore absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to honour him in this way. And um, it was pointed out to me earlier today, this is an honour usually simply kept for past presidents. So this uh, is <laughs> a dubious honour. Um, so this is, uh, <laughs> this is really just shows us how special and uh, how, how important the memory of Di is to us all. Um, but the Society, of course, was just one stop in an incredibly varied and wide-ranging career, and over the course of the next hour or so, we have a series of speakers who are going to give us, or try to give us, as comprehensive a view as possible of Di's life and work. So I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Chris Musson. Um, looking forward to this, Di's student days at Cardiff and his subsequent work with the Welsh Inspectorate up to 1977. Chris. I was... Uh Glad to hear plenty of laughter because there was always a lot of laughter when, uh, when Di was around, sometimes quite a lot of noise as well. Uh, but uh, uh, we were um, flatmates in Cardiff uh, a long, long time ago. This is actually a picture of, well, do you recognise him? Yeah. yeah? Uh, I don't know whether I would have done, but when you look back, he's there. Um, so we, uh, we started... Uh, together in, in Cardiff, uh, and uh, this is where I had my first uh, introduction to archaeology. I was actually a, an architecture student, uh, but I did a first year in the university, and one of the subjects I took, would be a snip, I thought, um, was, uh, was archaeology, uh, and that's where I met Leslie Alcock and Elizabeth here, and that handsome young man alongside them is, is me. Um, on the right, and I'm going to link uh, uh, Jeff Wainwright with, uh, with Di and, and with John Casey to an extent, uh, because um, uh, I'm not going to be here next week. My, my state of rather um, semi-undress is because I'm flying off to Armenia, where when I get there at 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, I know it will be well between 35 degrees and 40 degrees. So I have to go with as, as few clothes as I possibly can because I've got a big pile to bring back. Uh, well, let's go back and start at, start <laughs> at the beginning. Um, uh, Di on, on the left, you can see he's slightly taller. Uh, uh, Jeff on, on, on the right. Uh, Di is already looking pretty, um, you know, pretty inventive, I think. Uh, and Jeff has that sort of beady-eyed look that uh, usually presses one of his silences at the end of which uh, a decision would be made. Jeff's decision. Uh, he's not a man, I suspect, who lay in bed and, and couldn't sleep through self-doubt or whatever. <laughs> they were both, both a bit like that, but in very different ways. Uh, as, as you'll learn, well, as you will know from your experience of them, and we'll find out as we go through the meeting. Uh, Di was, uh, I'm told, a sometime uh, participant in horse riding, even at the Caffili Hunt. Whether he did he actually <laughs> hunt at all? He did, my word. And um, on, on the, uh, uh, the other picture, you've got uh, John Casey. Now, John and I and myself and Di Lloyd Owen, who's here as well, uh, were, were uh, flatmates in Cardiff for, I don't know, a couple of years. Uh, uh, in the 19, 1960s, uh, and we've remained friends and colleagues um, uh, ever since, really. Uh, sadly, we're getting rather fewer in number, but I suppose that's what happens over time. Uh, but we, all, we, we met uh, when we were 
uh, archaeology students of one ilk or another in Cardiff and really came together uh, uh, effectively at South Cadbury Castle with the, the excavations of Leslie Alcock, um, the site uh, called Camelot, allegedly. Um, and here uh, I, I could point it out, well, I can't point it out because <laughs> I haven't got a pointer. Oh, yes, I have. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is the trench which, uh, which Di was in charge of. Uh, it, it's, um, it, it was a, a long trench, uh, and uh, one of the... Uh, uh, here it is, you can see Di. Di I think that's Di. Uh, yes, it is Di. Uh, um, and why his trench is totally deserted at the time, I don't know, but anyway. Uh, and there's uh, uh, handsome me again on the, on the right. Um, I, was, uh, I always wore... A red hat and Leslie Alcock wear a, wore a blue hat and, and unbeknown to us we were known as we went round the side as Tweedledum and Tweedledee. I never found out which was the dumb and which was the D. Uh, this is uh, Di again um, looking a little bit glum uh, because the, the, uh, the Camelot um, uh, connection had been uh, supposedly, the alleged Camelot connection had been uh, played quite a lot in the press, and the press was providing some of the money for the project. Uh, and one of the embarrassing things that was found in Dye's trench quite early on was a gilt bronze letter A. Well, you can imagine how that might have been played in the press. <laughs> so uh, this is Dye, I think, is probably trying to, trying to think up stratagems for, uh, for uh, um, deflecting the ire of more serious archaeologists. Uh, it, it was a dig of its time. Um, there were many big digs at that time. We'd really started to dig on a large scale rather than uh, what was in his own day. Wheeler's own day was uh, quite a large scale, but with boxes. We were now working much more with open area excavation. Uh, and instead of a one or two metre uh, uh, trench through the rampart, we, we would have, in this case, was 10 metres, uh, which was considered quite big at the time. Uh, now you might do a 90 metre um, rampart section, I suspect. Uh, but the, the staffing was uh, university students, it was done in the summer, uh, and uh, university students as supervisors but the great number of people were real volunteers, people who may have no connection at all uh, with archaeology and had no experience. So the result was that you had people who didn't know how to do things being supervised for people by people, or site supervised by people who were learning to do things, who were being supervised for people who really did know how to do things. And the result was that a lot of good work was done but sometimes things just got away. And, you know, in the middle of July, it can rain for a week, and what do you do with 100 people on an excavation? You know, you, you, you finish up having to get back in there too soon and doing damage to the site. Uh, and that was one of the lessons that some of us learned there. Enthusiasm, enthusiasm great, uh, but too many people, too little skill, too much rain, or even worse, none at all. And when you've got none at all, you can see nothing. You can't excavate effectively if you haven't got water on the site. So it led to discussions, this also the days of the burdening of rescue work. Um, and uh, um, you know the idea that it might be possible to dig at other times than the summer. Uh, so that the, the idea of uh, an idyllic life digging on the sun-drenched hill forts wasn't really borne out uh, when uh, some of us who'd um, uh, uh, learned from our past experience and from Cadbury uh, set up a small team of uh, diggers who really know what they're doing. You know, six people who are natural diggers can do as much as 24 people supervised by three or four. Uh, so that's how we started. Um, and sometimes it was a little bit warmer than it we show here, but that's most of our team <coughs> on that particular site. Um, we did uh, go and sometimes, uh, well, once, 
um, helped with Jeff Rainwright, who was um, who was doing uh, a different kind of thing with with a permanent digging team, digging all the time, but again with larger numbers, uh, and uh, we would say with not quite the uh, uh, the rather deadly seriousness that we um, uh, tried to aim for in the rescue archaeology group. But we, we had a holiday um, once when we went uh, to work with uh, Jeff Wainwright and his group at Gussage All Saints. And uh, I'm, I'm always uh, grateful for that uh, because down that particular hole, yeah, it's gone away, there, <laughs> Uh, I was invited to um, to inspect a rather comely uh, uh, volunteer's skeleton, which I thought was a rather strange come on, but it turned out to be a dog skeleton in the bottom of a storage pit. Uh, and and not not too long afterwards, uh, um, we were we were married and um, <laughs> and still are. <laughs> so that's another thing I've got uh, to be grateful for uh, to Jeff. In that case, uh, the um, die really impinged very much on the uh, the pattern of rescue archaeology in Wales, in particular, uh, at that critical time. Um, it, it was uh, he who really um, conceived the idea of regional archaeological trust. There were many people who made a contribution to this. There were many people who contributed once the idea had, had taken root. And what, uh, what he envisaged was a uniform coverage by independent uh, um, charitable trusts uh, to cover the whole of Wales, which in broadly matching the, the new uh, local authority uh, structure that had come in at that time. So you had four, tr four trusts covering the whole of Wales, the richest being the smallest, which was Glamorgan Gwent, busiest more possibility of uh, external funding. Uh, the rest of us were, were rather more uh, rural. Uh, but the, one of the advantages of the system was that it really matched the, the um, uh, resources to uh, and uh, knowledge and understanding and stability to the different parts of Wales, the different kinds of archaeology that existed in those parts. Uh, and it rose really because the uh, uh, the providing for uh, a number of rescue excavation in Wales was getting progressively more difficult for the Ministry of Public Building and Works or whatever it was called then. So there was a needed need for continuity, there was a need for people who could provide their own equipment rather than having to get it from the, uh, the public works. Uh, also a need for flexibility of financing so that you could run things on a bit. Um, regional responsibility in relation to the new, the new local authority structure and a need for uh, sites and monuments record as a contribution to some kind of development control. In, in those days, uh, there was no likelihood that the Commission was going to be, the Royal Commission was going to be of any value to uh, in, any of the trusts except the Morgan Gwent because they were grinding slowly through the uh, medieval castles saying nothing about the rest of Wales. Uh, so Dye conceived this idea with help from Richard White and, and uh, uh, other people. Um, uh, Richard it was who suggested that uh, you could set up these uh, 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 independent organisations which would be able to receive money, take on jobs and, and as it were float money across the annual divide um, uh, and, and uh, would still be fully uh, and under uh, professional control because of their, their committees. Uh, and here we see Dye, Dye uh, and Richard Avent. Dye was the initiator. He left for London in 1977 and Richard was the sustainer uh, until his sad death uh, uh, some years later. Uh, they were steadfast friends of the archaeological trusts and have remained so, as have Cadu, uh, the, uh, the successors. Uh, to the ministry. So from 1974 to 2014, uh, the trusts have developed from initially rescue organisations uh, to now what I suspect might have been in, in Dai's mind anyway, 
regional archaeological services, covering excavation and survey work, records and development control, aerial survey and field survey, curatorial work, and education and cultural identity. A, 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 an association with their own area, building every little piece of archaeology that they can bring in into some st understanding of uh, a region in a way which can't be done by people who, um, for whatever reason, come in and go back out again. So some of the reasons we, uh, that we've survived for 40 years was um, we one f all for one and one for all. Uh, we decided that we would compete with each other in putting forward ideas uh, and proposing projects but we would, we would act as uh, a cooperative set up over the whole of Wales. So cooperation and competition, a sort of um, uh, creative tension to provide overall regional and national coverage. A regional commitment is a very real driver uh, and flexibility of funding. So 40 years on, uh, the trusts are still there. And I've got 10 freebies that anybody would like to <laughs> take away at the end. I'm certainly not the kind of going to carry them away because they're really quite heavy. Uh, one last story about Di, uh, fledgling TV star, because that's where we finish up at the end of this, I think. Uh, this is uh, the gate at South Cadbury, uh, where Di uh, was um, supervisor, and he was um, required to do a minute uh, Leslie Alcock could be told he'd got to do a minute and he'd just start and at the end of two minutes he'd stop. Um, Di was a, was a beginner in these days uh, and he was required to walk up the entrance till he got to the Saxon Gate and then he could, um, he could talk about the Saxon Gate. On about take six, um, he got it all right until the last word he said instead of being Ethelred, he said Ethelfrith or something. And that resulted in one of these great explosions uh, from Di, against himself, of course. I, I, I went away at that stage because I, <laughs> I didn't know quite what was going to happen. Uh, and I never saw the program, so I don't know whether he did the take in the end. So here we are. Uh, this, these are from the days of... Uh, of uh, um, and Blethian Gardens in Cardiff, uh, uh, flat, four, three flatmates together. Die! I cut you off that picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> this was this was Sheila and Die's 30th anniversary party here, and of course Jeff on the left uh, at one of his many homes in Pembrokeshire. Happy times. But I'm going off now to Armenia uh, to do rock art survey, and uh, I think I would say, like everybody here, thanks, Die. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, John. They're controversialists and they were innovators and they were colleagues and friends through 40, 50 years. And, and uh, I think, uh, uh, who was it who said, uh, we're glad you stood in our way? In a, meaning not quite what I first thought when I heard the expression, great to have been detained by you along the way. Thank you. And oh, I see. The, two, the two twins are just these. These. Um, these. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Um, our next speaker is uh, Chris Young, who's going to work with Di for many years uh, in English heritage and I guess its predecessor body too. Um, so over to you, Chris. Thank you. I'm doing this with the aid with the unaided human voice and no pictures partly because I don't recall doing that many site visits with Di. I experienced him more in the office and things associated with the office, which we'll come to later. Um, I'm very pleased to be invited to talk about Di's time in the inspectorate in England. And I realized at the outset that I needed help. So I asked colleagues, both who were in the inspectorate at the time, and colleagues who might have worked with him outside, and I got a very full range of response, out of which certain things emerge very strongly, both events 
and habits and characteristics. So my thanks to everybody who gave me help with this. Dai joined the, what was then the Directorate of Ancient Monuments and Historic Buildings of the Department of the Environment uh, in Fortress House in Savile Row 40 years ago. And he moved on from there to here 25 years ago. So what we're talking about is a time that is a generation and more ago. And the more I worked on this presentation, the more I remembered how different the world was then that it is, than it is now, as we will hear. Um, there were different habits and different expectations. I think I must first have met Dai in 1973 when I first joined the inspectorate, because I, I came as Jeff Wainwright's assistant inspector, organising rescue archaeology across the south of England, where rescue archaeology was very much created in Jeff's image. Um, whereas in the Midlands, you ended up with local authority units. In the south, you ended up with independent units. Um, and we had meetings of the rescue archaeology inspectors. And Di sometimes came to those to tell us how he was doing things differently in Wales. Um, and I'm, later, I shared an office with him which two colleagues have reminded me was always smoke-filled, which had totally escaped both Stephen Dunmore and me. We don't remember that aspect. Um, not filled by smoke from by us, I have to say. Uh, with, with him from 1977 until I changed roles at the end of 1979. Between my first meeting with him and when he came to share our office, well, I came to share his office in London, what, whichever, um, I met him at the All Inspectorate training gatherings which happened then for inspectors from Wales, England, Scotland and sometimes from Northern Ireland, which were very good occasions of, for various reasons. To my subsequent regret, I missed the one that Di organised, which was in North Wales. Um, it's much remembered by colleagues in what they wrote. It had a forward-looking training context which included going to exciting and unusual places for the inspectors in those days, like the Dinorwick Slate Quarry, industrial archaeology, which wasn't what we did as much as we did later then. But what's remembered is the final reception in Carnarvon Castle. It's remembered for various reasons. It's remembered for the famous Welsh harpist who played in the middle of the Castle Bailey to the assembled inspectorate. It's remembered for the amount of wine. It's remembered for Di's anxiety at the sight of senior inspectors tottering along the ramparts, <laughs> clutching glasses of said wine. And it's remembered because the police came to break it up at the end of the <laughs> evening. <laughs> because of complaints from the residents about the noise. <laughs> Di didn't tell me that. What Di did tell me was the story of his return to the non-conformist training college where the inspectorate were, being, were staying for the duration of this course, because he'd had to stay behind at the castle to clear things up. And eventually he escaped and he went back to the college, which was, as I said, Welsh and non-conformist. And as he arrived, he could hear a massive amount of noise, a piano being played and raucous singing. Um, and he was very concerned, he said, about the likely reactions of the college authorities until when he got inside, he discovered the piano was being played by the college principal. <laughs> so that was all right. But I think this incident picks up a number of traits in his character. He liked a good party, that puts it mildly. He had enormous affability and the ability to get on with people. He was forward-looking in his professionalism and what he wanted to do. He had ability as a trainer. Those of us who went through his public inquiry training courses later will remember that. Um, he had organisational ability and he had a sense of the dramatic, all those things which combined to make him what he was. He came to London as an area inspector in the southwest, um, Hampshire, 
Wiltshire, I think Dorset as well. But he carved out a role for himself in a much wider policy areas. It was a good time, I think, to move to the inspectorate in London. Apart from 1977 being the year in which Champers Wine Bar actually opened in Kingley Street, they must have known Dye was coming. Um, it was also a time of impending change in the inspectorate and what we did. Sorry, a bit of boring bureaucratic history. But 19, the 1969 Walsh Report had opened up the idea that more needed to be done about archaeology in the countryside. It was one of the things that led ultimately to sites and monuments records, which are now called historic environment records. Out of that too eventually came the idea of field monument wardens to provide a regular presence on the ground for the inspectorate to visit sites, talk to landowners, talk to farmers and so on, which for some of us was a bit novel. Um, and alongside that was the development of rescue archaeology and the increasing recognition of the ubiquity of what we would now call the historic environment. Um, and Dai, as we've heard, was very much concerned with rescue archaeology in Wales, much less so in England. It was also in the lead up, 1977, lead up to the 1979 Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act, which people don't often think about now, but which revolutionised the work of the inspectorate by introducing the concept of scheduled monument consent. That it, like a listed building for a scheduled ancient monument, you had to get consent to do works to it. Before that, the system had been that you gave three months' notice of your intention to do works, and then it was a process of negotiation with the possibility of very, very rarely using interim preservation notice to stop somebody doing something. Well, that didn't happen very often because it was quite expensive in terms of the compensation which then followed. Schedule monument consent put us on a much better basis, much more like people dealing with planning. So it was light years ahead of what we had been doing. Um, yeah. And beyond, so beyond his normal casework, which was always a punishingly heavy load, great stacks of files on his desks, desk. Sometimes I think we competed who had the biggest files, but Paul Gosling won hands down. <laughs> Die came second. Uh, one of my colleagues said Dye had the worst handwriting in the inspectorate too, in a hotly contested field. I actually doubt that, because it was John Hurst who had the worst handwriting, because he was actually given a typist to type out his memos, because nobody, but nobody, could read what he wrote. Dye, we could read, well the estimate was one word in five, I think, but it was sufficient. Um, so he focused on two main areas. One of these was the possibilities of schedule monument consent as a management tool and the need to, good have it, to have a good information basis, hence his interest in sites and monuments records, and good training to operate the SMC system with its inevitable public inquiries. He liked public inquiries. He liked training the inspectorate to do it by, as another colleague said, giving us slightly too small tables to put everything that he said we needed, like the water, the papers, and so on, and then watch us trying to cope with this. Um, it was all good experience. As Jeff Wainwright used to say to me now as assistant inspector, if he said, Chris, I want you to do such and such, it's all part of life's rich pageant, I knew it was likely to be difficult. It was when he sent me to see Brian Philp or Alec Down in Chichester or whoever, <laughs> or possibly some of the greater archaeologists in Wessex. Um, but he, and several of his co colleagues have vouched for the realism of his in public inspectorate training, and he liked acting as advocate in the inquiries, because I think he was a lawyer monkey, a, a, a role in which he reveled, often working with Jeff Wainwright, and sometimes, to quote one colleague, actually meet, managing to keep Jeff under control in the inquiry room. I'll give you just one example, which wasn't a case that I was involved with. It was a proposal to install a temporary test, temporary is the key point, test drilling rig for oil very close to Hadrian's Wall, about 300 metres from it. Um, it. SMC was refused. It led to a public inquiry in Hexham, with Dye as the counsel against the development and Stephen Johnson as his principal witness. The inquiry lasted three to four days, and Dye rigorously cross-examined 
the proposer's witnesses, but his key killer point was to insist that the developer put a balloon 35 metres up on the site of the drilling rig on the day of the site visit. The inspector saw that, and that was it. We won. Mind you, 10 years, 10, 12 years later, Northumberland County Council just gave consent for somebody to do exactly the same quite close by without anybody noticing. But never mind. But his success was based not just on his advocacy, but also on his very thorough preparations for each inquiry and his training of the rest of us to prepare and deliver our evidence. The second major area of his work was rural heritage policy, and there are several strands to this. He worked with other conservation agencies, such as the then Royal Commission on Historical Monuments, the Nature Conservancy Council, and the Countryside Commission. He looked beyond the scheduled ancient monuments in the countryside to the archaeology of the countryside as a whole, and saw the need to manage archaeology as part of the landscape. And one of the things he did was to develop the idea of farm management plans to protect archaeology, and so on. He worked to engage farmers. He commissioned some of the earlier publications on archaeology in the countryside and how it should be managed. And he also tried, got the field monument wardens to work with farmers and to a general advocacy. He was also brilliant at working with large landowners such as the Duchy of Cornwall and the Ministry of Defence. He was many years on the Duchy of Cornwall Consultative Advisory Committee, and he was summed up to one of his colleagues by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, as having the gift of the gab, <laughs> which he, indeed he did. The MOD is a particular success story, especially regard, with regard to the Salisbury Plain training area, which is, we always say, the largest area of unimproved chalk grassland in Europe, which I think is actually true and therefore an enormous archaeological resource. And Dye eventually persuaded the army they needed to take better care of the archaeology. They set up the Salisbury Plain Training Area Archaeological Working Party, followed by a consultative committee in which Dye played a major part. And he turned out to be very good at working with the army on a personal level. So we will be regaled with stories of how he was driven fast across Salisbury Plain in tanks an honour not given to the rest of us very often, or in my case, at all. And there are various stories that come out of this work. After a new signing system for archaeological sites was introduced so that the army knew not to shoot at them, um, that there was some kind of VIP visit to look at the new signage system, and the first barrow they arrived at, there was the new sign, and next it was a newly dug foxhole with the squaddy in it having his lunch. <laughs> As another story of a reception to mark the launch of some initiative in the Salisbury Plain training area. This was just after the historic buildings and monuments commission for England had been set up. And people hadn't really got used to the idea it was also called English heritage. Um, and in this big reception, full of important people, there was Dye. And the aide-de-camp comp to the garrison commander materialised, offering to introduce Dye to the brigadier. And he did so, saying, Brigadier, I wonder if I might introduce to you David Morgan Evans from the Historic Buildings and Monuments Commission, who has played such a prominent role, and so on. And the brigadier responded, Very glad to meet you, Morgan Evans. Glad you're not one of those expletives from English heritage. <laughs> Dye himself summarised his work on Salisbury Plain as a pioneering and experimental approach towards archaeological conservation in any sort of land use, and the largest scheme of archaeological land management, certainly in the UK, probably in England, and for the type of archaeological sites involved, there are few, if any, comparable schemes in the world. And that too is true. Dye was also heavily involved in setting up the field monument wardens which started in 1979, I think, uh, in recruiting them and providing regular training sessions. And the field monument wardens gave a great presence on the ground. And he did all this in addition to the normal load of ancient monuments casework for his area. And there were a number of other activities, which I haven't got time for today, including some international contacts. 
But Dai was also a people person, and I want to finish by talking about that. Apart from the field monument wardens, he worked closely with other inspectors and also EH administrators. And at least two of my colleagues said that he actually treated the administrators as being human beings. They didn't put it quite in those words. But he looked after them, he took them travelling with him, and they played an important role in his work. He believed in away days and informal networking. The Lamb at Hindon and overnight sessions there are much mentioned. Um, and he didn't believe over much in distinctions of status and could and did go directly to the chief executive if particularly cross about something. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if he hadn't left the English heritage round about the same time that Jocelyn Stevens arrived. <laughs> I think something would have happened. And it's noticeable that those who worked with him as their mentor remember him with fondness and admiration and speak of the care that he took in training them in both the large and the small aspects of working in the inspectorate. Everything from the fact that you don't need to read the whole of a file through to the coffee rotor. Um, his personality was strong, vivid and outgoing. And it was a very strong personality and very persuasive. I remember when I shared a room with him and three others that his mood when he arrived on a Monday morning could raise us to the heights or plunge us to the depths of gloom for the rest of the day. And he could do it all by himself, depending on the mood he came in in. And another colleague who lived down the corridor used to epitomise the extremes of his moods as die boom and die doom. <laughs> um, and apparently, when it was die boom, you didn't need to be told that because you could hear him <laughs> up and down the corridor. He had his eccentricities, or some might not regard them as eccentricities, but on the anniversary of the execution of Charles I, he always used to go down to the mass held in, in the banqueting house in Whitehall to mark the anniversary of, Charles King and Martyr, of the death of Charles King and Martyr. He was convivial and social. Lunches in Champers, the wine bar in Kingley Street previously mentioned, were legendary and lengthy. Um, although some of us can't remember all that much about some of them. <laughs> on occasion on his return, he would sometimes have a brief nap. I can remember him sleeping with his head on the desk. Indeed, I can remember him once being woken by the cleaners. I'd gone by then, but I'm told he was. But colleagues say that later, he used sometimes to have a brief rest under his desk where he could stretch out. But if the phone rang and was handed to him, he could answer immediately and cogently and coherently and deal with the caller without the caller realising that Di was actually lying on the floor. Um, as, I said, at the as, as I said at the beginning, those were different times with other customs than we have nowadays. Another colleague summed him up for me as a wonderfully stimulating, entertaining, knowledgeable and wildly infuriating colleague and friend who brought fun, challenge, wit, conviviality and scholarly entertainment. You really couldn't ask for more. And you couldn't. But in fact, the directorate and then English Heritage got a lot more than that out of him. They also got someone who took advantage of the changes in legislation to strengthen greatly the protection of archaeological sites through scheduled monument consent, and was one of those who transformed the organisation's approach to rural heritage. In both ways, he's helped to shape the approach of what is now historic England, and his influence continues to the pres present day, even though he left English heritage 25 years ago. Those of us who worked with him miss him, and we shall go on missing him. But he was great. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much indeed. I remember that smoke-filled room. There was a lot of fun to be had there, I seem to recall, and you brought back many happy memories, I'm sure, for me and, and many others here. Uh, our next speaker is Rosemary Cramp. Rosemary was the president, I think, for the last three years that Di was general secretary, and um, I think she's going to speak to us about Di's time as general secretary. Thank you, Rosemary. 
I should perhaps start this by saying thank you to Sheena, who has provided all the illustrations in this, um, in this talk of mine today. And uh, you'll see the reason why one of them couldn't have been from me at the end of it, I think. Uh, when I first became a fellow of the Society, um, hundreds of years ago, 1959, the secretary was a rather forbidding and rather grand person who really hardly spoke to any new people at all. It was, um, he maintained the ethos of an exclusive male club, and he was certainly not really much given to welcoming young females from the far north. Um, as, and in fact, the far north, as one president, um, Cyril Fox, had said, when the time of meetings was decided for the society just after the war as being 5 p.m., the president said, the present arrangement permits many fellows from the outer suburbs and home <laughs> service, uh, counties to come. No mention of anything further away. And this all changed, of course, with Di, but a lot had happened, of course, by the time Di took over in 1992. Chimes had changed considerably. Council was a more diverse place. There were more welcoming home sec uh, general secretaries. But nevertheless, the then president, Barry Cunliffe, um, saw there was much in the way in a society which needed modernization and a new look. And a relatively new antiquary, Diane, he was a relatively new antiquary, whose working life had been, as you've heard today, in a range of public service, had a range of skills and personal vigor to get things done. And Dai had to come in in the middle of a year. He hit the ground running, and he maintained this breakneck speed until he retired. Now, he had a tremendous capacity to absorb new knowledge in accurate detail. As the three presidents he served, or who served him, I suppose, um, would, I'm sure, testify. And he soon had a full command of the history and the mores of the society. In uh, 1994, as part of one of the endless reviews this society subjects itself to, um, Barry thought it needed, and we all had it in those days, aims and objectives. Um, and I pointed out this was already provided for us by the 1751 Royal Charter, the encouragement, advancement, and furtherance, etc. I don't need to repeat it to you, it's there in very large letters now as you come in. Uh, but Di kept these aims always in front of the fellowship um, and the council, and that was very important. And as Barry said in his final address in 1995, that in the three years he'd served, he'd served with him, new assessment had been made of the committee structure, the library, the lecture programme, external contacts, and the social life of the society. Uh, but nevertheless, it was the first occasion in 288 years that the society could boast a five-year rolling budget and an estimate for a forward plan. And Barry said, this couldn't have been achieved without the constant support and creative impact, input, I should have said, of our super energetic general secretary. Many fellows, I suppose, who benefited from this in these three years perhaps were less interested in things like that or the later redoing of the statutes as we did, what they liked was a new sense of inclusion. Joyful parties, December miscellanies, and um, mulled wine, the acquisition of the internet, which brought people together, newsletters, which culminated in salon. And if my tenure, anyway, is typical, we never f ceased fundraising. Now, Di had a tiny staff at that stage, but they all had to play several roles. Two of them are here tonight, I think, anyway. Um, Bernard Nurse and Di both gave lectures and tours, and they both brought their specialist knowledge from different departments to the development of the long overdue cataloging of our collections, which of course, as you all know, took a long time after that. And all the time they ensured the society made a mark and punched above its weight in the outside world. Perhaps the most creative um, event that um, I noted, um, which exemplified our input, was this uh, input into the birthday procession of our royal patron, the Queen Mother. 
I was the president-elect there, and I watched in awe and delight at the mace-bearing turnout that Di got together with this small group. And led by Simon Jarvis, we were all there. Yeah, we were there somewhere. <laughs> we were certainly there. Um, Di, of course, as we have heard, was not a paragon entirely. He could be irritated by those who didn't grasp issues quickly and produce a swift response. And there were those who said sometimes his responses were too swift. He had a sort of short fuse occasion in, could be awakened to rage over a range of issues, some of them very strange, but particularly, <laughs> um, particularly he could be enraged by what he considered were the, um, something that, where the Academy's uh, uh, importance as a society was not considered. And for a time, this was a, uh, a question of the Royal Academy's development of the courtyard. There was, first of all, the erection of pavilions in the courtyard without planning permission, which enraged I, always consultation with the other occupants, which engaged, uh, enraged him more. And if you want a judicious account of this, you should read Simon Jarvis's presidential address for 2000. Um, he, the, the, in the end, the Academy wanted the whole site cleared to put up sculptures, and then at the 11th hour, um, a scheme for fountains, water jets, and lighting emerged without any favorable consultation or anything to do with the um, conservation plan which had been developed. Now, Dye considered this totally inappropriate for a small courtyard with multiple occupancy. Um, <laughs> But now all was sort of all is now forgiven and forgotten. But at the time, as Simon said, in it, it would be idle to pretend that this evidence has not produced some occasional tension round our courtyard and a certain amount of pressure on our general secretary and president. Now I didn't. Oh, sorry. It didn't. It didn't quite reach war. Uh, <laughs> but and really, this was another episode. But the issue of the integration of and the diversity of tenure of the learned societies was to have a more serious test later than that. On a lighter note, um, the moment, from the moment of his arrival, Di created an atmosphere of welcome. And we've heard that, of course, from what Chris has said earlier. But new fellows were made to feel they belonged to a lively as well as an erudite organization. And visiting societies such as the RAI, were encouraged to use our buildings. And in fact, our buildings became the sort of um, place, the desirable place to meet in London at the, for the first time, and they still are, of course. There were memorable parties, not least the celebrations in 2001 of the 250th anniversary of the gaining of our Royal Charter. We had a summer celebration at Kelmscott where the bands played and the dancers danced. And we had a more sober gathering in the library in November with lectures and a really magnificent cake. I shall never forget that cake. Um, but even then we were conscious that the world was changing round us. In the same address in which I mentioned the pleasure of cutting the cake, I noted, I noted the increased burden on our general secretary with new governmental demands, the sort of demands we know now, but for papers on health, safety, risk assessment, museum status, reserve status, and most of all, charitable status. And even in my first year as president, tenurial status. This never let up, and we know now, of course, how it has increased rather than decreased in the society. And in 2001 to two, we were visited by the Charity Commission. Uh, and that was the time when we underlined for the first time the problem of our society. That it had to recognize, I said, in walking the tightrope between serving the interests of the fellowship and providing evidence for the greater good, which earns us our charitable status. We, I saw that and he dealt with this problem by creating significant improvements in our outreach. Of course, outreach is now all the thing, but it was still something then. Not only to our members, which strengthened the whole body and made them feel a force, but to the general public, and indeed to the government as well. 
There had been meetings before with our American fellowship where we reached out beyond the home counties and this continued. But in 2002, we held our first Thursday meeting outside London in York. And then many Northern fellows who had never even visited Burlington House came for the first time and were even admitted for the first time. And this sparked off the still flourishing York Fellowship. We followed this a meeting in Dye's homeland of Chester, in which fellows from Lancashire to Wales came. And we also held meetings with the Welsh and the Scottish antiquaries. We did less to open to the general public than has been done in more recent regimes, but we did engage directly with government on issues such as pressing for the continuation of the Portable Antiquities Scheme, which nearly founded, and also for the endorsement of the United Nations Charter on Cultural Heritage. And in all this, we were very much aided by APAG, the All-Party Archaeology Group, which Di and Rupert Reedsdale started in 2001. Yet in the end, the most pressing issue between us and the government was our tenure of Burlington House. This, has, this, te this, uh, this problem had rumbled on for many years and reached a sort of crescendo in 1995. But in 2002, there was a determined effort by the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister, and in an attempt to obtain a ruling on the terms in which the learned societies occupied Burlington House, uh, these uh, quarters at Burlington House, but at that time, of course, paying no rent at all. Eventually, the no case was that the societies were no more than tenants at will, or at the best, licensees, and so could be sacked at any time. After much debate, it was agreed that the five societies around the courtyard would present a joint case. And the Society of Antiquaries was named as the first defendant because we were the people, the one left of the three who had been given by, um, by the Crown a place at Somerset House. And I was the chairman of the courtyard secretaries and I think it took a great deal out of him and also a Bernard Nurse who marshaled the historical evidence in an amazing way, and you can read it. I think every antiquary actually ought to read Archaeological Journal for 2006 and see what was there. Di and Bernard and I sat through the proceedings, and it was clear that the position of each party was almost irreconcilable. I would very much like to have heard a judgment, I must say, but in the end, the Judge Smith reserved verdict and ruled compulsory mediation. And what I felt about that's in my anniversary address for 2004, I won't repeat it. But in 2004, there was a short-term settlement, and this is now under review. Di left before the conclusion of the mediation, but his farewell party was a suitably memorable affair. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a convivial occasion with music and dancing. Some people seemed to know their steps. For others, it was probably more problematic, I think. <laughs> um, everyone enjoyed themselves, and I suppose, really, that is what Di brought to the Antichrist, as he brought to everything else that we've been hearing about. He brought a new sense of purpose, and he maintained that sense of purpose. But he also brought laughter and fun. And he had never ceased to maintain his academic interests. And now in retirement, he could return to them and develop them and return to his beloved fieldwork, which you've seen at the very beginning of Chris Musson's statement. So this is what he did, and this is the next part of the story. Rosemary, thank you very much indeed. Um, very interesting to have a lot of what's going on at the moment in the society put in context and um, very aware of how much we're still working with Di's legacy um, for the good. Um, our next speaker is Howard Williams from the University of Chester, who's I think going to wind back initially to say something about Di's early life and then go to the other end and say something about uh, Di's retirement interests after leaving Bellington House. 
and let the images sink in for a second. And again, I thank Sheena for some of these images and to various other colleagues and uh, also for DVDs, which I've been trawling through and extracting some stills from to capture some moments of his television. Um, so I feel very privileged um, and also I um, feel burdened to present here today because I am not simply representing myself on a personal and professional level, but also all my academic colleagues and also somewhere in the region of six to seven years of University of Chester students who have been in touch with me over recent months with stories and moments of, of being taught by Di at Chester. And so I'm, I'm, I'm taking on those variety of different pers uh, perspectives in, in representing in this talk. Um, and I'm wearing my University of Chester tie, not out of some slavish um, affinity to my uh, academic institution, but because you'll see that tie, uh, Di introduced me to this idea. Why haven't you got a tie too, Howard? Um, <laughs> uh, oh, right, yeah, university tie, I'll get one of those. Um, uh, that comes in, you'll see, in a little while, I hope, in, in some of my images. So it's for me to talk about Di and Chester. Now, Di, I, when I got to Chester in 2008, I'd come across this Di Morgan Evans character. I'd, I'd seen him give a couple of presentations. I met him a couple of times briefly, and I, I saw, as one of the many archaeological Evans, his, his name on various publications. But I hadn't quite... Um, quite put a finger on what this guy was like because here I was coming to a new academic job my fourth and there was this visiting professor and I thought oh yeah I've seen visiting professors on lists of websites for various other more established universities they won't be here they won't be doing anything they'll just be names they were getting library access and maybe turning up for a drink every now and again but really they won't there won't be any connection beyond that uh, and then it quickly dawned on me that Di wasn't doing that he was in a, a, contributing to a department of history and archaeology with only two archaeologists when I got there. Um, the first question of the students to me was, when are you leaving for Durham? Um, uh, um, and, 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 and he wanted to make a contribution, not only because it was Chester and his home city, but also because I think he felt he could make a contribution at Chester. And he did. So I don't want to dwell too much upon what Di was like as a person, of which many people hear and afterwards we can reflect on. I want to talk about what he did for us. So first of all, he taught. He taught on the third year module, um, Archaeology and Contemporary Society, a whole range of subjects. And, and afterwards, I, didn't, I sat in on a few of these lectures as a, a, a review, you know, to sit in on a teaching review and appraise each other's lectures, and I was astounded by what I heard. I learned about nanorobots for the future of archaeology, and they probably are. Um, I learned about um, media and archaeology and its interactions and its complexities. And I learnt about the politics of archaeology. He taught students straight from his own experience of many years. And his connection with Chester goes way back. And Sheena's provided these images for me. And there's a long, tedious debate about exactly where this dig is. I think it's in Chester. And I think it is, it is, um, it is um, an early excavation. I think there's a bit of Roman wall there. Um, but we're, we're still, I'm still... Um, in discussions with different people about exactly who the archaeologist is on the right and which exact year it is, but I won't bore you with that. But here we are. This is to make the point that the links to Chester go way back. But that wasn't the only reason, as I said, that Di wanted to be involved at Chester. It was the, the, his affinity for the city, and we discussed that after his lectures at many uh, um, soup and sandwiches at Hattie's Tea Rooms by the North Gate, um, but also because he wanted to do more than teach. He wanted to initiate new archaeological research with me, which was a great honour, um, but also rather nerve-wracking. This is us in 2008. Uh, there's Dr. Megan Gondek, now Professor Modern, uh, Megan Gondek, and she's our head of department. There's a certain Dr. David Petz, Susan Youngs, and in the very far distance are Alex Turner and Sarah Semple. And, and, uh, and there's Di pointing at a monument that in the picture on the left he is measuring with Nancy. This is the Pillar of Elisag. And this is a very strange and unique monument. And uh, he was very keen to mobilise support to get that scheduled monument consent to do work here uh, for the first time in a modern sense. And so Di had this idea and he instigated more than, he brought to Chester more than teaching, he brought the idea that we should work with Nancy Edwards, and we, who's finishing her corpus of early medieval stone sculpture, and we should do some work and persuade Cadu uh, a, a certain Sean Rees and various other individuals who you may know um, to, to let us do work here, to do a new excavation. And this all began in 2008 and it led on to student training 
research excavations and community engagement project, um, Project Elysee. And Di came along and fully contributed to the first season of the excavations. And there's various action shots from the first season, showing a tour around Valley Cruces Abbey, um, striding around, excavating. He lifted a lot of turf and he did a lot of sieving for us. And, um, and also he came back briefly on the 2011 season to see how we were getting on. Um, I will say that it was, it, was, it was a brilliant project in many ways and a challenging one. It wasn't a big excavation, um, but it was challenging in many ways um, in terms of negotiation and working in um, a very precarious relationship with a farmer and on a scheduled monument. And I have to say that I missed Dye severely in 2011 and 2012, not simply because I, I missed being able to talk to him and getting his guidance, but also the power balance had shifted towards Bangor. And of course, uh, but also in an in, in important sense, I wanted him to be there because this was the project that he had wanted to really drive forward and he'd wanted to see the results from. Now, we're writing up the monograph for this now, uh, Gary, Nancy and myself, and we will, of course, be dedicating the final work to Di. Um, but I also want to reflect with you a moment on the future of this monument, this 9th century fragment of cross slab, um, and how we were excavating the mound, which proved we found evidence it was early Bronze Age, as many suspected. Um, but already, before our monograph has come out, and not really with our consultation, various heritage interpretations have already transpired. Um, and indeed, I wonder what Di would make of this, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the uh, new display of 2015, Game of Crowns, in the Eagle Tower at Carnarvon that we heard about before, where the Pillar of Elysegg, or at least a version of it, um, created by artist Aaron Watson in, in dialogue with Nancy, has now um, materialised as a, in a location where it is more visible than the pillar itself. It's a, it's a disturbing, and I think, would, I think it would challenge him, even in his most patriotic Welsh moment, to, to be fully reconciled with th this narrative spun around a monument he was keen to investigate. And as from earlier this year, likewise, uh, heritage boards have appeared for the first time since, um, well, in, in this century at least, in a long time, at the pillar itself. So I would say that Dye's idea of fieldwork has already um, led to new conservation of the monument and new interpretation of the monument, not necessarily in perhaps my, um, um, my, the way I would have done it. Um, and I certainly think Dye, if he was still here, would have some very strong words about this. But notwithstanding, it, it, it's, a, it's part of the legacy that he set up. And this is a monument that's like a, a sleeping giant in terms of politics, but it does occasionally get mobilised. Uh, this is the 2015 election, uh, um, uh, general election with uh, boards next to it. And somebody called Di Morgan Evans put that flag up in uh, 2010. <laughs> it was there for a few days um, uh, to, to give a bit of a, a patriotic uh, a tinge to the monument. But I think this is going to be an interesting monument for North Wales and for Wales and Western Britain more generally in terms of debates about... Um, uh, the period and the subsequent biography of this monument and Dai is fully um, um, you know, instrumental in that developing academic and public engagement de debate. Now there are many aspects to Dai's retirement years that I could talk about or his nearing retirement years I could talk about and I, I think the, the second half of my talk here I really just want to reflect on one of them. Uh, um, this is the two rebuilding or recreation, experimental archaeology projects of, of creating Roman buildings. And I confess that we're all niche scholars, we all have our things that interest us, and for me this is, even though it's the Roman period, only a few centuries before my interests really kick start, it, it really doesn't grab me. And TV archaeology doesn't, isn't something I've indulged in much. And so when I talked to Di, uh, when, when he, this, this second of these projects was, was coming um, about and he was designing this Rome wasn't built in a day, I must confess I had very little to go other than, oh, that's interesting. I, I really didn't, it didn't grab me. But I've just been re-watching these programmes. I'm taken by them. And I think they are distinctive and they have a legacy. And I just want to reflect on them uh, briefly. Rebuilding the past at Butser Ancient Farm, a fascinating 
programme to rewatch. Um, I don't know how many of you here uh, have seen the whole thing or part of it or remember parts of it, but it's, it's a bizarre and rather disturbing thing to watch of a sort of reality TV programme trying to do experimental archaeology where Dai's role really comes in on episode four with a, a somewhat staged but genuine in, the, in terms of how the project was progressing crisis moment where the villa was simply not going to be built. And Dai does come in and redirect it and re establish a program of works to lead it to completion and so here we have four shots from the nearing to the end nearing the end of the building project showing Di um, and uh, Christine and various other visiting experts casting their views over this first reconstruction of a Roman villa using traditional methods since um, the Roman period. Rather than gas on about it a bit more, I'd like to show you a bit of a clip. Now, vid video technology uh, may not work, but let's give this a go, because I think this sums up more than I can say anything about this project. There were those who thought we were not up to doing it academically, and there were those who thought that we couldn't do it physically in terms of the actual build, and there were those who thought it couldn't be done at all, and there were those who actually, unfortunately, and there are very few of them, I don't think particularly wanted us to do it. But we done it! I'd like, first of all, to thank those who had faith in us, the build team and the volunteers. They're the ones who actually did the work, flint by deleted flint, the way it's gone up here. Bits of, you know, door by deleted door has gone up there. It is brilliant, and, and our real thanks have got to go to those who put the building up. The villa, I thought, looked absolutely wonderful. All the statues outside, the box hedging. It was just amazing what we managed to achieve between us. Um, at the end of it, I feel I've learned a lot, but not so much as I'd ever want to do it again. <laughs> In my archaeological career, um, I'd certainly say it's one of my high points. Um, I mean, it's always difficult to measure these things, absolutely. Um, it was an unforgettable experience. No, it is an unforgettable experience because it's still there and going on. I mean, that's the great thing about this compared to some other archaeological programs. We've actually left something there which is almost permanent, which will be of great benefit for a very long time. It took 18 months, 500,000 flints, 4,500 roof tiles, 15,000 mosaic cubes, and the marriages, jobs, and dedication of a heroic team. In October 2003, Britain's first authentic Roman villa in a millennium and a half was finally completed. The past was rebuilt and now stands for the future. <laughs> complement that, I'd like to finish by reflecting on the second of these uh, programmes. Now, my t at the time, when I, I, and I actually end up, didn't realise in the last of the programmes, I even appear, there's me coming along with my students to do some painting at the very end, where we've got a very uh, colourful reception by the, uh, the, the, the celebrity builders, um, which I shall not repeat in this, to this audience, uh, but my students uh, took it on the chin and ignored them and got on and did the thing that Di wanted us to do, and, uh, but it was a, a programme that, you know, it was one of those TV programmes that you, I must admit at the time, I was thinking, oh no, this is just cringy reality stuff. Uh, but actually re-watching it, I realised how much that was only a very small fragment. There was a lot of genuine um, experimentation going on, there's a lot of genuine research, and in particular, of course, Dai's design. Dai brought to these projects his humour, and I felt his vision, um, and, and those things, the entertainment and the, the, the archaeological credibility, I think do shine through. And I do want to reflect on that by showing you two more video clips. Uh, the first one is the end clip from the sixth episode. And then I want to go back and show you briefly uh, Dai's reaction when he see Whether this is staged or not, I don't think it matters. But his reaction to the television camera when he first sees the roof going on, the, the structure he designed. These aren't very long. <laughs> The project has uncovered the amazing array of skills and vast amount of manpower required 
to resurrect just one Roman villa. The finished building will allow visitors to step back in time, to glimpse what life would have been like here when Roxeter was one of the greatest cities in Roman Britain. One room has been deliberately left part finished to show visitors the diversity of building methods and materials used in the villa's construction. The builders have used more than 30 tons of oak, 150 tons of hand-cut sandstone, 3,000 handmade roof tiles, and 36 tons of lime plaster. It even has a winged phallus to bring the building good fortune, just as its Roman counterpart had 1,600 years ago. It is a brilliant product at the end of the day, and I shall be proud of this until the day I die. It's been grand, it's been grand, Benny. Meeting diverse characters and working with complete fools is brilliant. You know, it's absolutely brilliant. I, you know, I would do it again, yes. And the final clip I want to show you um, is from the oh, forgive me, that's uh, is from the um, episode three. Same music. Best day ever. We finally get to see what the building really looks like, and it's bloody big. <laughs> it's amazing what we've done. To be honest, it's the best feeling in the world what we're doing because I'm spending 2010 building this and you can't buy that for money. Money couldn't buy that for the experience and all. And every day it's a joy to come to work. Dai has arrived on site and for the first time can see the true scale of the villa he designed. Oh, quite emotional. Quite emotional. If you design something and you can sort of sketch it out on paper, you uh, have it worked up, uh, you argue about it, you move it around, you have to alter it uh, and just try and produce something that works. But when you actually see it coming into being, that's good. So, to conclude, um, you've heard a lot about Dai's personality, his character, his archaeological skills, his vision. Um, for Chester, on, on his retirement, he brought a lot of those things to us, to my students, to my colleagues, to me. So, yeah, it was good. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking us from that journey with the small boy in short trousers to the uh, videos at the end. That was, that was great. Um, our final contribution is uh, from Adrian James, who was the Society's uh, assistant librarian for a very long time, 1980 to 2016. So he had lots of opportunity to work with Di, and he's going to summarise that, I think, in verse. When I composed these lines... I seemed to hear the voice of Di resounding in my ear. It said, Now, Adrian, you know the drill. Stand up and sock it to them. <laughs> so I will. We must be candid. There were not a few panjandrums of the senior fellows who, after the careful council had conferred and the white smoke arose, were overheard to mutter somewhat anxiously, Good heavens, it seems they've gone for David Morgan Evans. <laughs> Since no one knew just quite what to expect when Di was General Secretary elect. Of one thing we were certain, anyhow, the place would see some alterations now, because, at interview, 
When Dai was asked what his priority, if he were tasked to manage the society, would be, he answered with a little glint of glee, I think the improvement of its social life. <laughs> to this we'd yield like butter to the knife. <laughs> when first the darkling hall of cell.org die entered, he pronounced the place a morgue. <laughs> As general secretary, he moved to act restoring to these rooms the life they lacked. The vinous bottle and the party round annulled the torpor with a jocund sound. Not for an age, not since Dye's namesake John was president, had we so undergone re-education in the genial ways of social seminars and sweet soirees. Though pastime with good company and drinking were more Dye's line than bump or blue skies thinking, plans of campaign were eagerly unfurled and windows opened on the wider world. The general public, yes, the hoi polloi, approached these portals to perceive with joy prints and engravings, visages of kings, and lots of really nice old books and things. As partners in our purpose they were viewed, instead of peasants, ignorant and rude. Although in fairness, I should add that Hugh Chapman, Dye's predecessor, saw this too. Glasnost and Perestroika at that time were bandwagons on which you had us climb. Dye's earlier career was partly spent in monstering a prim establishment, and there were those who thought his Celtic fringe affinities betrayed a loosened hinge. <laughs> but people pompous, proud and self-important I strongly felt were being what they oughtn't. He craved the clangour of wit's fiery forge and wasn't solemn like our young Prince George. Then latterly, and somewhat unexpectedly for one who loved the 18th century, Di did diversity and dared derision by being visible on television replete with Roman villa where his friends attired themselves in togas at weekends. As a presenter, who was Di most like? Not barking mad, come Dr Magnus Pike. My TV references are to a man historical, nay antiquarian. <laughs> Neither signorially suave as Wheeler, nor yet the donish and discerning dealer in ancient cultures, studiously aloof like Kenneth Clark. Rather, Dye was proud that scientific thought could be embraced with human feeling by a man of taste, that progress in a science comes by arts, we welcome knowledge foremost in our hearts. Impassioned, generous, humorous on the whole, a life-affirming, large and liberal soul, readily touched and quickly moved to tears, a watchful ward of burgeoning careers, Dye's range of human sympathies was wide and paid no heed to any class divide. But certainly the ill-bred Philistine incurred his wrath. In 1999, there opened at the Royal Academy its Monet in the 20th century, and Di, for one, the RA failed to please by throwing up some PVC marquees without planning permission. <laughs> Jocelyn Stevens, who happened to be looking in, just as these edifices rose, walked out, fuming at such white monsters all about. Dai had a Celtic temper. When his ire was roused, it burned, 
a fast and kindling fire, and institutional arrogance he hated. Accordingly, the RA was berated. Westminster Council's planners that same day received a note exhorting them to stay the Royal Academy's too hasty hand by issuing an instant countermand. Though the Marquis were ready for the town, the planners met and turned the whole scheme down. Dye's triumph made the evening press take note, to whom he cackled, I don't like to gloat, but I'm gloating. The Philistines <laughs> are smitten. <laughs> we gratefully remember Dye for wit and ability to tell hilarious stories turned routine tea breaks into social glories. He'd met, in his professional capacity, odd types whom he'd recall with fine loquacity. Some army personnel he'd known seemed one with Dr. Strangelove's General Turgidson in almost superhuman doltishness. Di used to, to tell us about one fine mess, his horrifying near catastrophe, when in an army truck on Salisbury Plain, unexpectedly huge guns began to pound the track down which the vehicle ran. The army major he was driven by declared, a soldier's not afraid to die. <laughs> to which our die, who plainly gave a damn, squeaked, well, I'm not a soldier and I am. <laughs> Of all Di's many kindnesses to staff, the greatest was he often made us laugh. Some of us here are veterans, I believe, of Di's extraordinary Millennium Eve. For several months, a wild grand purr had spread throughout the land, an atavistic dread that all computers on Millennium Morn would cease to work and what rough beast be born. Di placed a banquet in the council room and in we came to face the hour of doom. Of meat there was no want, of wine no drouth. One reveller stuffed a trout's head in his mouth. Then after dinner, Di released our crowd onto the roof when such things were allowed, splittering fireworks burst upon the night. Above roared Concord at no greater height. Computers glowed, yes, they were doing fine. The world was saved. We went and drank more wine. <laughs> Just once was such a social night embattled. Just once was Di a little more than rattled. The summer wine cup, which we staff had fixed down in the kitchen, boasted Cointreau mixed with kumquats, plus substantial quantities of soda, but for which the potion is intoxicating to a high degree. Preparing this, was in the agency of a staff member ungainsayable in Vintner's law, and on her shoulders fell the due concocting of our special brew. That something was amiss, we shortly knew. <laughs> Proceedings started promptly, with the normal miscellany of papers and the formal transactions being closed with thanks returned in favour of their wine cups, Guests adjourned. These genteel fixtures in the month of June are placid as a rule, but very soon the fellows with signs of tiredness or emotion <laughs> or curious defects in locomotion <laughs> began to be in startling evidence. And some there were who seemed deprived of sense, assuming a position when alone, which properly may be described as prone. <laughs> While this was happening in the entrance hall, a visit to the kitchen revealed all. Our barmaid for the night, whose tastes were formed in Soho in the 50s, 
had not warmed to adding soda, deeming such dilution fitter for liquids destined for ablution. Di remonstrated, but the brusque response, fellows can't hold their drink, Di, came at once. <laughs> the Quantro proved a two-two heady mix. Now Pims removes the office politics. Undoubtedly, it would be very wrong to leave a false impression. Wine and song, and what goes with them, played the smallest part in ways in which Di took this place to heart. Work was, as it remains, laborious. As staff, we felt more was required of us. With issues of our tenancy here looming, and soon becoming ever more consuming, troubles popped up, too numerous to control, life seemed a gruesome game of whack-a-mole. When Di was under some undue duress, physical symptoms flashed of mounting stress. The premonitory signs to recognise were sudden facial tics, fast blinking eyes, the index finger that so often poked Di's spectacles whenever something stoked a smouldering indignation. But these niggles could soon subside in mockery and giggles. No man was less disposed to bear a grudge. No man should judge him as he would not judge. He might bestride the pulpit, but the pew was where he sat with people whom he knew, supportive of the staff and always just. Di offered loyalty. He had our trust. God said, and rightly, blessed are the pure in heart amongst whom Di's place is secure. <laughs> Ours is no time, and Di was not the man to be a septuagenarian assistant secretary, although Carlyle and Philip Corder, by a country mile, retained the post long past retirement age. But Di, a youthful sixty, quit the stage. To publish an appropriate ovation, we held a party on this great occasion. Even the library was cleared and for one single night became a disco floor which gallantly, if groaningly, confessed the Terpsichorean prowess of each guest. The vast and hallowed carpet offered traction to steps for I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> Nor was this all of which these vaults could brag, whenever that grim lyric, what a drag it is getting old, was hollowed out or bruited, the sentiment could not but be confuted. With Di, the dance floor dervish, wild with wit, leading our feet, we made a night of it. With Di in charge, we staff had, to the end, a gracious colleague and a loyal friend. This institution, by his wise election, gained optimistic, outward-bound direction. We all miss Di. I miss his sense of fun. He's missed in many ways, but everyone whose life he took absorbing notice of remembers him with laughter and with love. Thank you. Well, what can we say after that? What a tour de force. It was quite wonderful. I think we need to discuss publication so we can all savour it. <laughs> um, 
Before we finish, I know that Sheena, I think you'd like to say a few words. Well, on behalf of myself and Di's family, I'd like to thank all of today's speakers. Uh, they're all extremely busy people, but they've given unstintingly of their time and energy to provide these knowledgeable, witty, and above all, kind and generous accounts of Di's career. I know they did it for Di, but we too are hugely grateful to them. We're also grateful to Jill and the officers and fellows of the Society for their generous hospitality today and their staff for so much of the background work which has gone into organising this event. Behind the scenes, Stephen Dunmore has been key to the planning and Howard Williams has done a brilliant coordination job. Di was very lucky in it finding exactly the right profession for him and in the friends and colleagues he worked with. He drew strength from them throughout his career, including through the controversy and argument which he greatly enjoyed stirring up. <laughs> we and his family have also felt the warmth of your support during his illness and in the last six months, and we give you our heartfelt thanks. Diochen Thank you, Sheena. Well, as we've heard, as well as being admired for his remarkable professional skill and achievements, Di's conviviality and sense of fun were also a very important part of who he was. So I feel quite certain that he would expect us to continue these celebrations in suitable style, and appropriate um, arrangements have been made, ladies and gentlemen, outside. So do please go and enjoy yourselves, and do talk to Sheena and all the family.